Okay, virtual pilots, it's Requiem, and today we're going to check out the DCS F-18 Hornet. The F-18C Hornet is a single-seat fighter attack aircraft built by McDonnell Douglas, which is an upgrade of the avionics and weapons capability of the single-seat a model. It's powered by twin General Electric F-404 engines with afterburners, so that it reaches speeds up to Mark 1.8 and altitudes up to 50,000 feet. It's been flown primarily by the United States, with the Navy and the Marine Corps, but it's also served in the Air Forces of several countries such as Canada, Malaysia, Australia and some others. Coming in at 56 feet long and an unfolded wingspan of about 40 feet and 5 inches with missiles, it's got a trapezoidal shaped wing with 20 degree sweep back and leading edge extensions moving from the wing root to the front of the cockpit. It doesn't have elevators but instead has differential stabilators which allow each horizontal stabiliser to move independently of each other. It has a sturdy tricycle landing gear with fixed engineer inlets and twin vertical stabilizers which are angled outwards at 20 degrees. The cockpit itself is mostly digital, save for a few analog instruments, so there's a lot of capability to unfold and systems to learn how to manage when you get into the Hornet for the first time. The flight control is hydraulically actuated, including leading edge flaps, trailing edge flaps and ailerons seen here. The leading edge extensions increase the stall angle of attack, but they generated a vortex which caused buffeting around the tail along with some structural damage. So by installing fences on these lexes, they generate their own vortex which strengthens those produced by the lex. This reduced the tail buffer and allowed an even higher stall angle of attack. Both the rudders and the stabilators are also hydraulically actuated. But the stabilators, as mentioned, have a differential capability. Here we can see that as we move the ailerons left and right, the stabilators will move differentially and this helps to improve the maneuverability of the airplane. And the stabilators themselves also have a mechanical backup which is linked to the control stick in case of a full digital failure. In flight though, all of the control services work together to facilitate what the pilot's inputting. This will include those differential stabilator deflections talked about earlier, as well as the trailing edge flaps which will help act as flapperons to help improve the maneuverability even further. Exactly how these leading edge and trailing edge flaps are scheduled is a function of the airspeed, flap switch position and the angle of attack of the airplane. The canopy is electrically controlled using a switch on the right side of the cockpit under the canopy sill and when taxiing it should either be in the fully closed or open position and not anywhere between. Since the main customer is the US Navy, it was designed with that in mind. So it has two nasal steering modes and low gain and a high gain. The low gain allows for 16 degrees deflection, while the high nose gain allows for 75 degrees deflection. This is ideal for making tight turns in confined spaces such as those you find on an aircraft carrier. You can reduce the wingspan even further by 13 feet by keeping the wings folded until you're ready for launch. To launch off the catapult, the Hornet has a launch bar. And this gets extended hydraulically and it will disengage the nose of steering. And as you taxi forward into the launch gear, the launch bar will drop over the catapult shuttle and it's going to be held in place while the shuttle is tensioned. And the catapult is going to do what it does best, launching you from 0 to 200 knots in about 2 seconds. Once you're airborne, you're going to head off and go do the mission that the F-18 was designed to do. As a designated fighter attack aircraft, the Hornet's able to perform both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missions. There are nine weapon stations available to use. If you're going for a full air-to-air -air loadout, you can take a mixture of semi-active radar guided AIM-7 Sparrows, a fire and forget AMRAM, a heat-seeking Sidewinder missile, A 20mm gun as a backup. If you want to maximise how many missiles you're going to carry, you can carry up to 10 M rams with two sidewinders on the wingtips. But the sidewinders can be used on inner stations as well if you wish. If you go with AIM-7s though, each missile is much larger so it's going to take up a whole pylon by itself. So you won't be able to carry as many. This makes them a better option to use for either of the cheek stations on the side of the airplane. For air-to-ground armament, there's a large variety of options to use depending on what mission you want. 
Before I kill ships, you've got a weapon called the AGM-84 Harpoon at your disposal, and with a range of about 100 miles, you can definitely reach out and touch a ship without putting yourself in danger. If you're going to go on a mission to suppress or destroy ground-based radar systems, then the weapon you're going to choose is going to be the AGM-88 Harm. Now this missile will detect emissions put out by these radars, and when you fire the missile it will actually home in on a particular signal, as long as the emitter is still turned on. And the range of this is highly dependent on your speed and altitude, so if you're up at about 40,000 feet going over Mark 1, you can stretch out the range to about 80 nautical miles. Now if you wanted to use laser guided munitions, there's plenty of options for that as well. So remember to bring along the outflow lightning pod. So this way when you release your bomb, it will track the laser, paint it onto the target all the way down to the ground. But if you didn't want to bring your own system, you can rely on a buddy laser system or a JTAC on the ground. Now if you want to be really lazy, you can take the AGM-154 JCL. This way you can program GPS coordinates on the ground, or you can actually use the bot to designate the target before firing it. Now the AGM-154C model we have has the broach warhead, which is good against hardened targets. While well, the other version is the A model, and this has a cluster munition, and using this will allow you to hit more targets over a larger area of ground. Sometimes though, we just want to keep it simple. This is where the dumb munitions come in, and here we just put the cross on the target to release the bomb. No fancy gear or techniques required here. Now in addition to all the unguided bombs that the F-18 has available, there are also unguided rockets you can use too, which are great to use against a cluster of targets holed up together. But considering there are such a large amount of air to ground weapons available, no matter what mission you have, the Hornet should be able to have you covered. In a modern environment, you'll have to defend yourself against active airborne or ground based missile threats against you. For that, you have the AL 47 counter system, and this is fully programmable or manually controlled, which will let you dispense chaplain flares for self defense. So, if you do have an inbounder attack, you'll perform evasive maneuvers and drop flares against a heat seeking missile. Otherwise, you'll perform these defensive maneuvers, but then you'll drop chaff as well. This will help avoid any radar guided missiles. To detect active radar threats against you, you have the ALE 67 radar warning receiver, along with a display in the cockpit, which will show where it's coming from. There's also a jamming option, and this will use the radar to try and prevent locks onto you. Sometimes, though, no matter what you try, you're just going to be destined to take a hit. If you do happen to survive, and the Mark 14 Martin Baker ejection seat will be there to get you out safely. The internal fuel system consists of four fuselage tanks and two wing tanks, with a total capacity of about 10,800 pounds. You can severely limit your range by relying only on internal fuel. However, with a normal maximum landing weight of 33,000 pounds for carrier landings, there's going to be cases where you need to reduce your landing weight quickly which you can do by deliberately dumping excess fuel out of each vertical fin through a dump outlet. When going on longer missions though, you'll think about equipping up to three 330 gallon external fuel tanks, and these can be jettisoned before you enter combat if you wish. But this jettison function can also be used no matter what's on the weapon station. Now if you'd rather carry more weapons instead of the fuel tanks on these stations, you can utilize the air to air probe and drogue refueling capability of the Hornet. You can use this with either a KC-135, an S3 Viking, or a KC-130. Being able to perform an air, air refueling consistently well takes practice though, requiring gentle stirring of the stick and some throttle adjustments. The APG-73 radar in the DCS Hornet is an upgrade of the APG-65. It's an all-weather, all-aspect search and track sensor that will detect targets at any altitude, but it can also be used in an air-to-ground capacity as well. It has a maximum range of 160 nautical miles and a coverage of 70 degrees either side of the nose. The radar picture it outputs is shown on the radar attack page, and this is usually shown on the right DDI. When used in an air-to-ground capacity, the APG-73 can be used to map specific areas of terrain at various ranges and resolutions as well as tracking both moving ground targets and sea vessels. In addition to regular position lights, the F-18 has eight formation lights which can be used as references to maintain formation during night operations. When you go fly, you have the option of equipping either night vision goggles or a helmet-mounted sight known as the JHMCS. 
The Helmet Mounted Sight is really useful because it lets you use your misses off bore sight so you can look at them, lock onto them if needed, and fire. It can also be used to designate ground targets and point sensors such as the radar and flur at it, and this sight needs to be aligned when you cold stop the aircraft if you plan on using it. In the unlikely event that you end up spinning in the F-18, both the left and the right DDIs will display the spin recovery mode. This will tell you which way to push the stick, and by following this instruction, you'll be able to recover from the spin safely. A G limiter is installed on the airplane, which prevents you exceeding positive 7.5 G when you weigh about 32,000 pounds. This will decrease to 5.5 G when you weigh more than 44,000. However, in the emergency, you can override this limit with a paddle switch and throttle to increase the limit by one third. Systems of the Hornet are navigated using a tiered menu system, broken down in either the tactical menu or support menu. And being able to navigate through these menus will help you utilize the aircraft most effectively. And behind the control stick, there's the MPCD. This is the only screen which can display the moving map. However, it can also function as a display, like the left and right DDIs. And of course up front we have the heads up display. And this has the ability to display a lot of information to you with a lot of different symbology. So it's important to understand this before you go fly. Regarding automation, the Hornet has a basic autopilot which can hold an attitude or altitude or go to a waypoint if you like. It also has an auto throttle system, which when engaged will maintain your speed uh, during approach or in cruise flight. And of course, because this can be a carrier based aircraft, you have an arresting hook available that will help you come to a quick stop once you land on the deck. So arguably the biggest challenge you're going to face after a mission is coming back to land on the carrier safely. If you're in VFR conditions, you'll recover using case 1 procedures. But if you're having a mixture of IFR conditions and VFR conditions, then you would use the case 3 procedures until you're visual, then you can use case 1 to recover and land. This is known as case 2. While the case 3 procedures are used at night time or in IFR conditions. And if you happen to be unsuccessful in any kind of approach, and I'm executing a bolter to go around and try again. And because these are conducted in challenging conditions such as nighttime and or including bad weather, you're going to be relying solely on your instruments during the entire approach until you have the ball in sight and come in to land. This can provide a big challenge and requires a lot of focus after you've done a long mission, but with enough practice you can get the hang of it and be successful. So that's all I got for the overview of the F-18 Hornet. In the next video we're going to have a look at the uh, startup procedure using my cockpit workflows. So until next time, remember to fly safe and check your six.